Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Tonight we're going to be reading out of Revelation 1.13, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Something interesting with this particular verse and a couple of others in the Bible, there's a movement out there. Some of you know about this because I've told you about it, but some I got some new people here, maybe they haven't heard about this. But there's a movement of supposed Christians out there who believe this is saying that Jesus isn't male, but that he has breasts. They say God has breasts and the Holy Spirit has breasts. They call him the trans God. Yeah, uh, you can't get further out of context with that kind of understanding. And it's ridiculous and ludicrous and heresy. This is not what this is saying. The translation here in the New King James is girded about the chest. That's exactly what it means. If you go and look at the original language, that's what it tells you. It's so silly. Some, uh, some of the stuff people come up with. And they, they can't possibly be reading the scriptures themselves and getting that. Somebody taught them that. So disappointing. Um, because I, I, I think humans are better than this. And I hold them to account to that. But it looks like they just don't want to be. They want to be deceived. They want to be. They want to live in deception. Just like Paul Washer says. He goes, people ask me all the time. Um. Uh, why doesn't God just go open the gates to hell and let everybody out? And he said, if God went down there and opened the gates and said, all of y'all come out, they would run at him and slam the door shut and say, we don't want you. People want this. The Bible talks about this in multiple places, Old and New Testament. They want this. They want people to lie to them. I covered it when I was doing my prophets uh, playlists. Multiple times it was stated that they love to have it so. Don't tell us the, the harsh things. Tell us the sweet things. Lie to us. We'd love to have it that way. It's terrible. Terrible. All right. So the whole verse, verse 13, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Let's read this in context. Let's see here. I'm going to start in verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. That's very interesting that he says that. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. That's at the end of the tribulation. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. That would have been Sunday, by the way, not Saturday. They started Sunday worship uh, after Jesus went up, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to, Th to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of those seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He speaks every language at once. We, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he said, or, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. The reason why it terrified John is because John saw that look before not in this imagery, but he saw that those fiery eyes and that sharp two-edged sword at one time whenever Jesus cleared out the temple with the whip he made. He saw that look. He saw that anger. He saw that frustration. He saw that fire in, in Christ's eyes. And he saw that same fire here. And it, it messed him up because he, he knows. This letter is a very important letter that he wrote that Jesus gave him. Very important. The book of Revelation may be the most important book in the Bible. And Jesus goes on here and continues talking about everything that was going on there. We're going to skip over that and go right here. 
one like unto the Son of Man, appeared to John in Patmos. And the beloved disciple marked that he wore a girdle of gold. A girdle for Jesus never was ungirt while upon earth, but stood always ready for service. And that what it, that's kind of what it means. Gird yourselves up, be ready to, to go. And now before the eternal throne, he stays not in whole, or he stays not is, he stays not is holy ministry. I think they missed a letter there. But as a priest is girt about with a curious girdle of the ephod. Well, it is for us that he has not ceased to fulfill his offices of love for us, since this is one of our choicest safeguards, that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. You can bank on that. Jesus lives to make intercession on our behalf, every minute of every day for each one of us. Jesus is never idler, never an idler. His garments are never loose, as though his offices were ended. He diligently carries on the cause of his people. A golden girdle to manifest the superiority of his service, the royal of his person, the dignity of his state, the, the glory of his reward. No longer does he cry out in the dust, but he pleads with authority, a king as well as a priest. Safe enough is our cause in the hands of our enthroned Melchizedek. The Melchizedekian or order of the priesthood is, there's a lot of mystery behind this. And Ken Johnson over on his YouTube channel has talked about this greatly. If you're not listening to Ken Johnson, he does a lot of good theological stuff. Um, he's really explanatory. And he has been one of the men that has been translating a lot of the, the scrolls from Qumran. Um, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So uh, he's very well versed in this stuff. And he, he shares a lot of very, in, in fact, just recently, they found another church father that talked about a pre-trib rapture. So the evidence for the pre-trib is mounting from the first century on um, in favor of it. Uh, be that as it may, it's very, very interesting here. Uh, the, the the whole secrecy, but the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The the mystery behind the Melchizedekian order. It, there's a lot more to it than what we've been told and a lot more to it than what we realize. And I would imagine this has something else to do or attachment to heaven somehow um, because even Melchizedek was a very interesting individual, very strange individual. There's no record of his mother and father. I think the Bible even records that. Where did he come from? And Jesus is of the lineage of Melchizedek, too. So, very interesting. There's a lot to this. A lot more that we don't know and the Bible hasn't told us. Our Lord presents all his people with an example. Everything the Lord talks about and has done is an example to each one of us. We must never unbind our girdles. This is not the time for lying down at ease. It is the season of service and warfare. I did some of that today. Service. We need to bind the girdle of truth more and more tightly around our loins. It is a golden girdle, and so it will be our richest ornament, and we greatly need it. For a heart that is not well braced up with the truth, keyword, as it is in Jesus, and with the fidelity which is wrought of the Spirit, will be easily entangled with the things of this life and tripped up by the snares of temptation. See, well, I told you guys about last night and this morning about that image I had in my head, and I couldn't, it was like in my mind's eye, I couldn't get rid of it. My eyes were open, but I still had this image in my head, and that one verse kept recycling, wounding the heel. This may be the wounding of the heel, what he's talking about right here, That's because that's what's happening today. That's why we have such a great apostasy right now from the truth. They're, they're leaving the truth. The, the church as a whole has been completely gutted. Just small pockets of believers. That may be the wounding of the heel. The more I think about this, and the more I look into it, even just a, a cursory look in the scriptures, the more I believe that's exactly what that's referring to. This is the last time. This is the bottom of the feet. This is the end of the of the building of the body. And that heel is going to be bruised. We're the last little bit, right at the end. And Satan's going to do all the damage he can. But our Lord is going to be victorious over it. It is in vain that we possess the scriptures unless we bind them around us like a girdle. When I tell you guys about living the armor in Ephesians 6, don't pray it. Don't put it on and take it off in, in some kind of, of prayer or, or an ordinance or some kind of, of ceremony. Live that armor. You live that, but it be that way every day. That's how you put that around you as the girdle. 
The scriptures need to be attached to you. You need to be familiar with them as possible. You need to be in them as much as you can and have them be at your disposal because the Holy Spirit will recall it even if you can't remind or remember it. Surrounding our entire nature, keeping each part of our character in order and giving compactness to our whole man. If in heaven Jesus unbinds not the girdle, much less may we upon earth stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. And that's from Ephesians 6, what he just said. The belt of truth to hold you together. So whenever they would, they would gird up their loins or gird themselves up, what that was, because everybody wore those long robes, you can't run in that. And so if they needed to run, what they would do is they would reach down between their legs and grab the back of the bottom of the robe and pull it up forward and hike it up their legs and tuck it down in their belt and cinch that belt down so it would hold it. So their legs were free to move and not trip over the robe. Then they could run. That's what it means to, to, to gird yourself up, is to pull your robes up and tuck them in your belt so you can move, so you can run faster. And so this is the symbolism of that. There's work to do. There's activity that needs to be done. We need to be girt up. We need to be gird ourselves up. We need to be in the truth every day. Be preparing for any battle. Be ready with a word of truth, a word of encouragement. Be ready to stand. Be ready to fight. Be ready to help and to be a blessing to others. Me and my wife both have been doing that all day today. We've been, we've been all over the place at appointments and here and there, grocery store. And uh, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. I got... A, a woman in it had a little ice cream van, was at H-E-B, and she had been in there shopping and had come out. And she got in and was pulling out. She was parked next to us. She was pulling out. And I saw the look on her face. And, I, and instantly it hit me. I'm going to cheer her up. I said, hey, play the music. She turned the music on. And everybody was laughing. Everybody thought it was funny. And my wife told her, you just made a grown man's day. And so she turned it back on again. And she just smiled lit up her face. And just little things like that are some of the things that we do just by us being us, just by us being encouraged by him. Everybody's miserable now. Uh, this, all the stuff with COVID just broke people. Be the shining light. Be that light that lights the way. Be the salt of the earth, that savory salt to season things with. Because nobody else wants to do it. Everybody else is miserable. Everybody else hates everybody else. We can be different. We can be the example setters. I had people, just random people, just look at me and smile for no reason. Never seen it before. And I wasn't even looking at them. I'm walking past and I notice out of the corner of my eye, they're looking at me. I turn and look at them and they're smiling. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But the only thing I can think of is that they can, maybe they can sense the Holy Spirit. Maybe they're believers too. Holy Spirit recognizes Holy Spirit. Jesus gave us the example. Let us be that way. In this day and age, with the way things are now, that's something that's in very short supply. Somebody taking the time to, to talk. Some of the young women that are working at the registers at HEB, you know, they get treated terribly by older people. Just they see the smile on somebody's face when you acknowledge them, validate them, take the time to talk to them and, and tell, let them know, I see you. You're a human. I see you. I acknowledge you. Because most of the time they feel like nobody even cares. And that can be anybody you run into. Somebody passing in the grocery store. Somebody passing on the sidewalk. Somebody passing in the halls of a VA hospital. You can be the difference. We need to be the difference. Jesus was the difference. And if we're going to be his emissaries here, if we're going to be those people that are emulating his qualities, that's what we need to do. And, it, and like I said, it's going to be different for each of us. Some of us, it's going to be solely in the home. Some of it's going to be a struggle because of who we're around and the environment we're in. But we can still be those people. Because when the Lord grants repentance to anyone around you, if he opens their eyes and it suddenly dawns on them, oh, I need to get saved. I need to know more about this. They're going to remember that you're the one with the answers and they're going to come to you and you can lead them to the Lord for salvation and bring another brother or sister home. Add another member to the family. You can't take anything to heaven with you, but other people. This, this is what we do now. Give people hope. 
And that hope can be an encouraging word, a smile, a nod, a good morning, a good evening. That hope could be the gospel. That hope could be a good deed, helping someone out when they need it, assisting someone who needs assistance. I mean, it can fall, it falls under so many categories. Remember what Jesus said, if anyone gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, literally the least possible good deed you could do, the least significant good deed you can do, Jesus said he will in no wise lose his reward. Those little things add up. Those little things matter. And the Lord pays close attention to them. Just like he blesses us in little things, we had a lot of close calls today, but none of them involved us. The Lord has put a hedge of protection around us. And so when we travel, no accidents. And my wife remarked on that today. She said that it really is a blessing from the Lord that we have that. I agree. That's why I thank him. That's why I thank him constantly. Because he's blessed us beyond measure. How about I share some of that blessing with other people? <laughs> 10 years from now, that lady in the ice cream truck is going to be sitting somewhere and suddenly the memory of me asking her to play that music is going to pop in her head and it's going to make her smile. 25, 30 seconds. Stay with somebody for the rest of your lives. You never know. And it may be that one thing that gives somebody a little bit of hope to keep going, to keep moving. And maybe to come to heaven with us. Lord, thank you for your wonderful blessings that you bestow upon us every day. Thank you for the gifts that you give us, the gifts of peace. I got to talk with the nurse today, the peace that defies all understanding, joy inexpressible, and she had her gospel music playing. And just, Lord, you, you bestow so much upon us, and we take it for granted, and the world distracts us from it. How about we start paying attention to that? Lord, make us to see, make us to know, make us to understand, make us to be ready all the time for those moments. Meanwhile, I've had a bunch of them today. People noticed. People notice. People see. Lord, you make sure that they see, Lord. Open their eyes to the truth. Grant them repentance. If their name is on the rolls, we need to get them in, in the door. But Lord, bless us so that we may encourage others and give others a hope to look forward to. Not take it away like so many do today, but instead give them something to hope for. Give them something to look forward to. And make us to be gracious and loving to those, even those we don't know. The random people we meet every day, everywhere we go. Because in that we glorify you. I thank you, Lord, that you watch over us every day. That you protect us every day. That you constantly bring us home safe when we're out driving, especially in San Antonio. And that while we're at home, we're safe. I thank you for our home. And everything in it, and everything about it, you pour out your blessings daily on us. May we give thanks for those things. We're looking forward to seeing you, Lord. We're eagerly waiting till you come. In your name, amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Evening Devotion. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.